everyone. Wow, quite a full house. Wow. Thanks for braving the rain and making it out here today. Um, so last year we covered, if some of those were uh, here last year, we covered um, what you know, we could do better if we knew things before. And this year we decided to pivot to what's 20 2023 going to have in store for us. Um, before we start this panel, I just want to do some quick introductions. I'm Sam Gaglani. I'm the EVP of Global Business Development at Exola. Been at the company 11 years and been in the industry about 20 years. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Kara Bates. Hi, <laughs> I'm Kara Bilkis. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Skydance Interactive. We are part of Skydance Media. We have film, TV, animation, sports, and actually two interactive groups. When you're talking to Skydance Interactive, SDI, we are a VR first publisher. Awesome. Uh, Michael Lewis, I lead the direct to consumer team at Take Two. Um, I think I see my boss in the audience. Oh, you no. can stick to uh, easy questions this time. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. oh, that's you. Uh, yep. Oh, no problem. Hi, I'm Jenna Seiden. Um, I'm part of the global business development team at Niantic. We are an AR technology company. We also made a little game called Pokemon Go. Just a little game. <laughs> So we've been talking uh, about what we were going to discuss today. And God, it's already March. And a lot has happened this year. We've seen the crash of some se several big banks. Crypto's crashed. It's come back. Um, AI now is like the hot topic. Um, and VR is kind of surfacing again. So I think today we're going to discuss probably two topics, AI and VR, MR, and AR. Um, when we talk about AI, we're talking about ChatGPT, we're talking about Google Cloud, uh, Cortana, all of the uh, big platforms that are coming out. Um, I have a pretty strong position on it. I'm not gonna share it because these three are the subject matter experts, but I'm gonna kind of guide the conversation and see uh, where things fall. So I'm gonna leave it to the group. AI, what do you guys think? Is it taking over? Are we, are we gonna lose our jobs soon? Or artists, programmers, engineers, designers, or are we, you know, is this the, the, the heyday, or is it too early to tell? And I'm going to throw it out to the group, free for all, go. I think that AI isn't anything new for gaming. Mm -hmm. um, historically, we've dealt a lot with determinative AI. And now there's a real focus, especially with chat GPT, yep. on uh, generative determinant AI. Yep. Yep. Um, and chat GPT is very popular. Upcoming is an integration with Slack. I think that that's going to have a high level of engagement. Uh, and I think it's exciting right now for it to be as um, easily, easily accessible as we're, as we're seeing it. So would you see Skydance using this for specific projects? Or have you already started integrating it into some of your workflows? Um, we haven't started yeah. integrating it yet, but we are definitely heavy Slack users, yeah. so I could definitely see us using it. We just did it for our Google Chat. We did a uh, GP, uh, chat GPT integration, which I'm kind of scared about. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably going to get far better communication from your colleagues. I know. It's kind of crazy so. what I'm seeing. Um, what do you think, Lewis? I mean, I just think, having seen a lot of these technologies come and go, I feel actually like this one's really different, honestly. So having seen, Ooh, why, having seen why? crypto, so it's, it's, it's one of these things that I think is, will fundamentally transform a lot of workflows. So when you think about, you know, generating concept art or what a lot of us do is like summarize and synthesize information differently, mm -hmm. yeah. stuff's really good at it. You know, I just asked for, what was it yesterday? Um, a couple of the main points of like COPA, yeah. and it, it ticks off it ticks it off for you, yeah. and it's like eighty percent right, so you can't really use it as a substitute for legal advice. But it actually like did an incredible job just summarizing this stuff and presenting it back. But wouldn't like a Google search do that as well? So I think I think this is where it's like it's going to really change the way that Google search works, which is why I think Google's so scared of it. Like if I can <laughs> just usually what you want, you know, I like a lot of other people, I cook a little bit and I do, um, you know, so you go search for a recipe. Yeah. And if you search for a recipe, it's like the entire person's life story and then like 200,000 <laughs> ads. And then at the very bottom, it'll have the recipe. And you don't and think that's like, gonna happen with ChatGPT? No, you just punch in, 
you just punch in like what you want, like a recipe for something, and it's yeah. like, there's the recipe. It's like, I didn't have to learn about this random person's life and backstory. <laughs> and as someone who makes like a cocktail blog on the side, That's it's gonna cool. ruin my <laughs> cocktail blog side hustle, but I think it'll, the time They're that I'll save from like ads. recipe I support, will still, it'll we'll blow still go. support you. We're all Thank still gonna go to the cocktail blog. Yeah. I, don't know, um, I look. I just look. I look at AI. I agree. I agree with Lewis. I think you know. You look at it like when you're doing an investment. What's going to be faster? You know, better, quicker. You know, higher quality. So if you look at the positive sides of AI, you know, in terms of what we do in AR, VR, or game development, if it can help with coding, right? Roblox is using it. They made an announcement a couple of days ago, right, about they're using it for materials in code building. If it helps generate 3D assets. Like the hardest part in what we do in AR and VR is, is not the tools. We have all the tools for that. It's the 3D assets. Yeah. So if we can really help with the 3D assets, that's great. Now, there's the negative side. I, I think ChatGPT is a smooth talker. Like the way that it, it's so smooth when you read that Definitely, stuff. It makes yeah. you believe it. Yeah. And it could be completely wrong. Totally. You know? So you have to like think sort of negatively against that side and ethics and all that stuff. We're not here to discuss that. But I think AI is a tool that can do something faster, quicker, better for us in a smart, ethical way. I'm excited about it. And no, I, I didn't use it for my performance reviews. I didn't. I really didn't. <laughs> but you could. But you could have. But it's like, it's that kind of thing that's <laughs> different than a lot of other technologies where it's like, you can immediately see five to 10 applications of that in your daily life, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just a lot different than some of the other things we've seen pitched as the next big thing. Like, I really think. <laughs> 10 years from now will be. But this is where I want. Yeah, it'll just be different the way that we're composing emails or scheduling. But or will it be composing emails for us? It's going to change. Automatically. I think it won't be like automatic. I yeah. think you're probably still going to be an idiot if you just like <laughs> generate a whole game and then shove that onto the internet and you don't proofread any of the code it wrote for you or the same with emails. But it's like it'll. I think it'll automate a lot of those things that are really hard to get so like started. like a virtual assistant in yeah. a way. And like virtual assistants today are terrible. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's really horrible. It's impossible to, it can't really schedule your thing and maybe it knows about what's going on, but it won't factor in any of the like time it takes to walk someplace or mm -hmm. the three minutes the call goes over. But I think even that's just like, it's just if you look at all of the things that you do on a daily basis, sending emails, reading emails, you know, extracting information from it, putting together Excels, I think it's gonna be much better at doing those things. Or people will be better at doing those things with the assistance of AI than they are today. With Could them. you see it doing a code review? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Totally, why not? Mm -hmm. Most of the code reviews are, you know, many of the code reviews aren't that great today, you know? Yeah. Like I think, <laughs> at least if it's my code review. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's, uh, I think it could absolutely do, do that and, you know, even like lower level things in code reviewing, like checking for vulnerabilities and dependencies, like a lot of yeah. that stuff's automated today and I think that things like chat GPT could definitely help with that. Okay. But then just like the cold start thing, I think is just gonna do really well. Okay, now what if you're a young artist just starting out, is this going to impact your career path or? Like yeah, it's just sort of premature to say that it's, like any of these other major epics where a new technology is introduced in history, the net amount of jobs I think is going up, the jobs are just different. So I don't okay. think it's gonna mean that there's no longer artists, but it'll change. Uh-oh. No, 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 I don't disagree. It's like, you know, maybe some of your parents or your grandparents used to say, oh, I, I remember when I had to walk through five miles of snow to get to the bus oh, stop. <laughs> and I'm gonna say, I remember when I used to write my own papers and stuff, and yeah. you know, there's that. But what you said before was interesting. It, in terms of what jobs is it gonna replace? You know, At first it was like, oh, it's gonna take away, respectfully, blue collar jobs. And then now it's like, oh God, it's gonna take away creative jobs. I think you have to look at it the way you sort of paraphrased it before. People who use AI are going to be the ones who keep the jobs versus those who don't use AI. Interesting. Like in other, if you haven't learned how to yeah. bring adapt, it into your, adapt, and, adapt and tell those stories in different ways and use the AI in a smart way, like those are people who will still have jobs. The people who fight it, unfortunately, I think. it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. I mean, I love it because no one has said the M word yet on the panel. Do you know <laughs> what the M word is? What is the M? Metaverse. It's taken over from Metaverse. That's true. I'm very Thankfully. Happy. Oh, thank God, yeah. <laughs> and we have strong views on the Metaverse that we're not very, gonna discuss We're not today. gonna discuss, <laughs> that's why I like AI. <laughs> yes, yeah, so for me personally, I've, I'm terrified of it because I'm thinking from a business development standpoint, is it gonna replace me? Hopefully. <laughs> yes, thank you, Michael. 
I get you won't have to talk. You won't have. I won't I call get you anymore. I done much faster. Totally. Yeah. No but one's replaced. Could it me. ever do a, like an, a, a red line in agreement for me? There's always those nuances, as you I know, man. I'm curious what Kara has to say about. Could you? Would you use Chat GPT to red? I, I think to your point, uh, you adapt and you use it as a tool. It doesn't take over for you no longer thinking or being responsible for whatever that task is. Um, but just think about like an agreement, right? There's, do you really read the force majeure clause or the? I do. Unfortunately, I'm sure, I, probably. I do. But there's like, <laughs> there's like thirty clauses in the agreement. So if it could just do a diff and True. say like, hey, these are the things that are different. I will tell you, using that example, we have, I have five different attorneys I work with, and depending upon the agree, same agreement in front of all of them, and they all have different feedback. Totally. Yes. So. It, you still need to be the person who owns the fact gathering and the information yep. and you make a decision. But I, I do think it's, we should embrace it and that it could, could be a useful tool. Yeah, and you still need domain expertise and you know, Definitely. yeah, I mean, there's, it's the nuances, it's, it's the gray. It's the gray that actually helps you win the argument. It helps you advance. It's the things you're solving for that hasn't been learned yet. Uh, you know, they can make some great predictions with AI based on data sets, but yeah. Again, I, I'm always negative, like not even glass half empty, I've shattered the glass and cut my foot. Like that's how I look <laughs> at the world. So yeah, I am scared of it. It'd be naive for me to say I'm not, yeah. but you have to embrace it. And I think there's a lot of good, like I had to search for, I had to do a quick dungeon crawler search the other day because I was trying to explain other IP other than Dungeons and Dragons to people. I'm like, there are tons of other dungeon crawlers. They're like, no, there aren't. So I chat you. It's gave awesome. you everything you it was needed. Great and descriptions, <laughs> and they're like, "That was so great. Thanks for the research." I'm like, "No problem." <laughs> so for 2023, do you expect if to there be a big jump, or do you think ChatGPT will just kind of stay where it is, and, and year over year we'll start to see more and more features? It'll be used for more things, or I think it's at the front end the of front, integration. It's the beginning of it, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that especially with the Slack integration, people are going to be using it and exposed to it. Yeah widely yeah. and once masses are exposed to something and how they are adaptive and how they bring it in that will create the platform too for the next for evolution the next evolution yeah and then lewis from a corporate standpoint and i know your boss is here but um <laughs> if if takes you were to take, like really take it seriously where could you see it being being applied i mean i don't i don't know that so take two doesn't usually work from top-down mandates, Got it. so it's much more of a bottoms-up company, and each of the labels and teams, you know, Rockstar, 2K, Private Division, Zynga, have their own, you know, disparate cultures, so I don't sure. think yeah. that Take-Two sure. would necessarily say, thou shalt use, you know, ChatGPT in this way, <laughs> so it'd be much more of like a bottoms-up synthesis. But just to piggyback on, you know, one thing you just said there, I think it's, it's also like a little early to, ChatGPT is definitely the first mover here, but I don't know that It'll you know, be they're the going to get a ton yeah. of competition, yeah. right? Like Google's going sure. to really heat up their investments in it. Google, you know, made TensorFlow, yep. which is like the underlying algorithm that a lot of the generative AI stuff uses. So it's, I think it's a little premature to call ChatGPT there. The I just think like. Yeah. Oh, know, I, I didn't was, mean ChatGPT is the definitive yeah, the, winner, but I meant the totally. concept. The concept yeah. itself, yeah. And I just think like, you know, I have a son who's two and then one who's nine months old. So I think like by the time that they're, graduating high school or college, it'll just be intrinsically part of their workflow the way that hmm. you know computers were intrinsically part of my workflow. And you know, I, I think that that's, it's, it's one of those things that's just a generational change. So we should be spending a lot of time, you know, everyone trying to test it out and just mess around with it. Yeah. Jenna, I'm gonna leave the last word with you if you wanna add anything. Like how would Niantic approach it, or your? I mean, with yeah. all exciting new things, you know, Niantic is uh, responsibly testing it. We do a lot of R and D. We haven't made any formal announcements, but like I said before, I think anything that can help us, especially with our web AR technology and our platform um, app technology, it's mostly the three D assets right now. Is sort of the top yeah. for us. That I mean, sense. that's. I yeah. mean, we need that. We need that uh, to bring up the terrible M word. Um, what I like about what's happening in the next year is that we're looking at the individual technologies now, I think, and not just the whole fighting over the definition of metaverse. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, let's talk about AR, let's talk about VR, let's talk about IoT, let's talk about AI, let's talk about all this. Because those are the pieces that enable the metaverse. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm excited about 
about how we're all looking at those things and anything that we can do for AI to help advance that. Got it. Yeah, so I think oh. it's still early. But yeah, right. I'm excited. But you look at ChatGPT4 compared to ChatGPT3. Yeah, that's just true. that delta alone and the differences in what it can do is pretty amazing. So. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So for me, the key takeaway was Sam doesn't have to worry about his job. <laughs> uh, adapt and evolve. Safe for another year. Safe for another just year. Just a year. Just a year. Um, so we've got 15 minutes left, and I wanted to tackle VR, AR, and MR. Because I remember when I was here in 2016, that was the hotness. These rooms were filled with people talking about VR was the next big thing. Cara, what <laughs> happened? Cool <laughs> things have happened. <laughs> you know, I think if we look back five years ago, we had, you know, very expensive hardware mm -hmm. and um, really a requirement that people that used it had a very high technological savvy just yeah. to engage with it. Yeah. Now prices have dropped, more people can play, grandma can get in there if mm. she wants. Um, I also think with that, so many more players are present and it makes you think about what compels players, what compels yes. people. Content is so... True important and not just any content. I mean, no, this isn't talking VR, but I think uh, Google Stadia is a really great example. Great tech, but not great content, and then what happened to it. So we're at a time right now in VR, um, thanks to incredible platform partners like Meta and Sony and Pico, they've really brought in a lot of developers saying, hey, let us help you a bit. We'll contribute to your development cost, and we want more developers. We want more content. Now we have more content, but there's also a big distinction between content and content. Mm. Not to plug Skydance Interactive, <laughs> but um, I'd be remiss not to say that we just launched uh, The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, Chapter 2 Ooh. today on PSVR 2 and PC VR, and if you go and take a look at that game, you will understand what I'm saying. This is not content. Yeah. This is branded IP developed at its best, not just to drive ga game sales, but to drive hardware. So I think the play now is, it's undisputed, Oculus Quest has been the king. Mm -hmm. um, PSVR 2 has now arrived, and we are looking at, for many, the road to VR is through gaming. So I think with the PSVR 2, it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, it's not just arguably the lowest price point and getting um, habituating lots of players to VR being not just an emerging platform, yep. but it's arrived. And it is really only going to continue to arrive. I've said a lot, but the bottom line is I think that um, it's going to be very exciting to see the quality games that are coming now and the decisions that developers are going to need to make. Are you going to go after a you know, PS5, Xbox One crazy um, budget, or are you going to take a risk and create a disruptive game that has cool elements and really has the opportunity to um, catch attention and be recognized as a changer, market changer. Well said. So what's it going to take to get VR into the hands of every person right now? Where are we? Yeah, I Where, think, where's, When's Ready Player One happening? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that what's unique about a VR yeah. experience <laughs> is it's fully immersive. Yeah. I mean, you are talking about a different kind of experience. So I think it's an exciting time to have um, big, you cannot, just because you have a great IP, that is not going to sell a game. You have to have a great game and the right IP connecting at the same time. Okay. And the hardware has to be appropriately priced so that everyone could access it. I mean, I don't, if you look at Apple and when and if, whatever they're doing, are they launching a VR ecosystem, are they launching a gaming headset, but having hardware that everyone can play and great content that excites people. Mm -hmm. It's that experience. Players will come back, they're not fooled. They want a great experience. game. Experience, yeah. 
So from an AR, MR perspective, how, what are your thoughts on this? I'm excited about the hardware. I mean, I come from content. Um, I come from traditional console games first, and then I went into VR. And it's funny, I've shifted because I believe that original IP is what sold platforms. And now I believe licenses actually will sell VR, actually. But I'm excited about MR, uh, mostly because when we launched, I was at Vive, HTC Vive in 2016, and then I went to Quest. <laughs> but we didn't have any context. The audience had no context. We yep. were selling something there was no need for. And so that was really hard. But now, I think some stat I read recently was like 100 million people last year touched VR. I don't know if that's, that's not obviously Quest sales. Fast but chat GPT. I did not chat GPT that. <laughs> um, I think I just Googled that. I'm a, I'm a, You're go, so old I'm school. Old school. <laughs> I'm so old school. Um, but I'm excited about MR because now, from the Niantic point of view, right, we're all about digital on top of the physical world and, mm -hmm. and uh, making this, this world more magical. And I can go into all Niantic's wonderful pillars, but that's what we do. And so the fact that there's so many players now in the MR space, and they're marketing to people who mostly already have the VR headsets, or they know about VR. And I don't want to say anything great about the pandemic, but it helped raise awareness of VR, yeah. obviously. Silver lining, for sure. It was. Um, so for, for mixed reality, you know, when you're seeing the Quest come in and you're seeing all these other devices um, playing with MR, um, I'm excited about that, uh, selfishly, from the Niantic point of view, because we want to be help get our content and services out onto these platforms. Um, and give people, yes, great Pokemon Go experiences or NBA or other branded Walking Dead, absolutely. But I do think there are, uh, until those devices become part of your everyday life, education or work, you need a portfolio of content and experiences that make you tied to that device and that will drop the prices and then you can choose, if you want it to be a game console, great. If you want it to be for education, all that jazz. So for me, for this year, I'm really looking forward to the mixed reality push, and those are different than the connected devices, Ray-Ban glasses and things like that. I just want to make a, a yeah, just distinction. Give us a what do you mean by that exactly? So. The Ray-Ban glasses, I mean, each one, uh, the Enreal, I don't want to mispronounce, misquote what, which version or skew is what, but a lot of those look like regular glasses and they're projecting uh, video or they, they're, they're lighter experiences yeah. versus real, you know, engine-based, clunkier than the than the wired machines, but yep. connected devices versus MR headsets. Um, sorry, I'm not defining it as well as I could. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm focused on the, the Quest 3s of the world, Got and it. the Picos and all their fun. Could I jump you, in with oh, the I know you got something note? to say. Yeah. Go for it. Can we just do like a show of hands real quick about how many people in the audience have a VR headset? Wow. Hello. And how many, <laughs> how many of you guys used a VR headset in the last week? Bullshit. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, you know, I think the challenge. I think the challenge with I VR is just that it's really, really expensive. Not just for customers. Not just in terms of the actual cost of acquiring a headset. But you know, the median price of a house in the U.S. I think is something like three hundred dollars a square foot. And if you want to have a space for VR that's dedicated and not have to deal with you moving need stuff area. around all the time, yep. it's like two hundred square feet. That's a sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollar investment. investment. Yeah. So I just think that. Yeah, you know, that's the biggest challenge for VR itself is that space. Space. It's really hard to get space. And I, I know that there's some improvements on the line there or coming down the line there in terms of, you know, ways to see the physical space around you while you're still in VR. But I think those two things are always going to be in tension where, you know, they need to have something immersive and also have, um, you know, they need to have something immersive and also be able to see what's around you so you don't walk into stuff. But at some point, it's going to get to a point where the space, you won't need a lot of space. Well, you want to be but outside. Yes. Well, that's, well, that's where I think that that's where we I'm come in. less bearish on mixed reality. I don't, oh. I don't know. I don't want to walk around with some weird set of glasses that yeah. are like all lit up and everything. And everyone, you know, people make fun of me enough. You know, so it's like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time conceptualizing that. But that yeah. could just be my innate. It's true. It's very, I mean, I think when, so. Putting anything on your face, people are very sensitive about. That's why the Ray-Ban thing was the nice entry point for, yeah. for men and everybody, because people are used to that, right? Yeah. Anything yeah. on your face, uh, sensitive. Um, tons of studies on that. And, and why do they actually even have to look like regular glasses in what we're building? They can look like visors. They can look like anything. Yeah, contact um, lens. Yeah. It's going. We're not to be, there yet. We're not there yet. But There's, you should see some of the stuff that's we, coming we out. We will be. No, but you know, for Niantic, you know, we're all about getting outside. 
Um, the pillars are, you know, explore your neighborhood, exercise, get off your butt, walk around, and do it in real time social. Do it with people, do it with your friends. That's what Pokemon is, that's what NBA All World is, our upcoming titles, it's very exciting. And, but no one's built these headsets ergonomically for, or for outdoors. Um, Magic Leap 2 is great, great, much better yep. field of vision than other devices, but it's really expensive and it's, it actually works decently outside, but it's not built for outside. So years ago, Niantic built a reference to design natively for outdoor AR. Yeah. Um, we're partnering, you might have heard, with, with Qualcomm. We're still in the process of commercializing it with a partner, so we're not making it. We don't make hardware. We're partnering with experts who do. But there needs to be somebody who builds these things, yep. to your point, because I actually just did my taxes, and I figured out what square footage of my house that I could write off for my business because I needed all there you the go. space. <laughs> I did. did you That's get amazing. To do it, I did or? not did use ChatGPT. <laughs> I do things myself, actually. I'm keeping my job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I do think there needs to be an evolution in building things for outdoor for those those problems, for, for jobs, for certain things that require it outside, because I do think that layer, not only if it's magical or entertaining, it's gotta be utility as well. So you need yeah. to build the headsets for that so I can play Walking Dead, or I can go outside and walk around and toggle on a channel and say, today I want a meditative experience and I wanna walk around my neighborhood and have that kind of beauty, or I wanna get around. I mean, we're building a map for the world, not for people, but for devices. So they can tell you within precision mm -hmm. where to turn and where to go. So that's, that's what we're doing, because we believe that the index inflection point is gonna be heads-up displays. Yeah. So if we're gonna event horizon this, would you say 10 years where the price entry will be that a normal person that makes 80,000 a year could get this thing 15 years? That's so Avatar. interesting. <laughs> I, I feel like um, if we're talking about the average salaries or the average American lives That's paycheck to paycheck cool. yep. and people still have play games on their mobile devices and have console players and play, play their PC games. So I, I, I feel like um, costs are coming down. I've personally seen, although I'm not allowed to talk about them, uh, two different hardware companies and what's coming out Ooh. in Q1 and Q2. <laughs> so uh, prices are coming down, the offerings are better. Yeah. Um, they're full body offerings I'm talking about for VR hardware. Um, it's getting better. It's, it's getting better in terms of the quality of what it can do and the price point. Yeah. So um, from a VR point of view, I think it's a very exciting time. Okay. Lewis, what do you think? 10 years, 15 years? I mean, Where are we? I still just think that the fundamental challenge of something, wearing something for a while that's totally occluding your vision is mm -hmm. gonna make it challenging to have that technology see really broad yeah. adoption, is my, my honest take on it. That said, I love VR. I think it's awesome. <laughs> I think it's much better for you know driving games and other genres than anything else. So it's not, while I really am enthusiastic about it personally, I just think that it's gonna have a challenge with going from niche to a really broad market adoption. I'm with but you on I'd that. say also like there's spaces outside of just video games. You know, there's yeah. other places or applications think. for it. Absolutely, yeah. 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 So, you know, that's that's just my personal take on it. And Jenna, on the AR MR side, <laughs> what's your I, I can't answer the years, but I, the two factors that are gonna affect it, I mean, it's gonna be a while. I think uh, it's edge computing is mm. gonna affect things yeah. very much so. Um, and uh, I also think that um, optics, the lenses, uh, that's gonna be a big factor in making these things more approachable or using them outside and stuff. So those are two factors that are gonna change things for me. Got it. Versus just 5G and but ultra band and other stuff are gonna affect things. Yeah, I, I agree with you guys. For me, it's the space issue and putting something on my face and being able to walk around and not look like an insane person, that I think is, I, I so think 20 vain. years. I know yeah, I am, yeah. but I think that's 20 years off. You look beautiful, off. Sam Liner. No, you look better <laughs> than me though. Um, but I think it's 20 years off. I really I'll tell do. you something, this one upcoming device like was cognizant of how women typically haven't liked to put it on their yeah. face because of their makeup. Mm -hmm. And so that's they have huge. a whole, it, they have a solution for it. I'm like, that's smart. That's cool. They yeah, are yeah. anticipating, and why? Because women are real we'll players. Yeah. Well, yes, mm -hmm. and well, whoever likes to wear makeup. <laughs> yeah, the point is, it's um, the the needs and the issues are being anticipated, and they're building accordingly. Yeah. Well, guys, we're we went, blew through our Q and A time, but oh, no. I think we didn't. Oh, we still have time. So we're going to open it up for Q and A. If anyone has. 
some questions they'd like to ask these lovely people. Oh, we got one person. Hello. Hello, Nicole Lazaro from Zio Design and uh, a 30 year game veteran and working on an MR XR experience called Follow the White Rabbit. Great panel, uh, and I'm big. We're integrating AI at my studio, kind of at every layer of production, which is awesome. Uh, but I didn't. I would love to hear a little bit more, just about fun, especially just to build on what Kara, what you were saying, is like, what is the impact of AI on fun? Are we going to see new gameplay kind of loops? Because um, the new glasses are coming. These are the Snap spectacles, the AR Ooh. spectacles, and it's like all in one. There's mm -hmm. no 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 puck, nothing out, no phone. Uh, so what are sort of new gameplay? Um, uh, what, what, how's it going to impact gameplay, and then how will AI, how soon are we going to get really robust world segmentation and semantic understanding? We've got a little bit, but I really want to have like the white rabbit running around and really understand that's a chair and be able to, you know, do new kinds of mechanics uh, in a, you know, projected AR world. AR. Well, on the segmentation side, you know, we're We've got sky segmentation and all the stuff on the Niantic side, and we're slowly rolling more and more of those out. So yes, the rabbit can splash on in mud and fly and know when it's in the air and going through the cloud. Uh, as for AI affecting the gameplay mechanics, I mean, we're exploring that. I can't speak to anything specifically there uh, in that regard. I mean, right now I'm looking at it, and we're looking at it more from expediting the workflow position in terms of the coding. I mean, you've seen where someone can use a picture of something and suddenly AI can generate a website, right? Uh, or pretty much code a game. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said for like UGC that's gonna inform us. Uh, as a, we're a big company, we're not as nimble as we used to be, I think. And we're gonna learn from you and other folks out there as to how that's gonna inform our game design. Because I think a lot of us who come from the more traditional side would be fighting it a little bit more than not. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, great panel. <laughs> um, you guys all represent pretty awesome franchises. I mean, you guys have worked on Pokemon Go. Uh, well, you guys worked on everything today, too, as part of your company. Uh, the Walking Dead. Um, something that I've kept my eye on for a number of years is the types of applications that stretch what a platform can do. Mm -hmm. And Kara touched on it briefly as well. I think that Pokemon Go was one of those okay. early watershed moments where people saw it and said, wow, this is what AR can be. And I'm more in the VR space, but one of the things that I'm wondering about I see a weird stretch happening where a lot of VR companies are focused on ubiquity. How do we get to 100 million? How do we get to 200 million users? How do you balance a casual gamer audience that has you know, 20 million, 30 million people that just want to play a game briefly, and a hardcore audience that is most passionate and that wants to see return content? I think that is something that's really hard to do in the VR space. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Maybe you have thoughts on it on the AR side. Uh, maybe you have thoughts on it on the VR side. I think for us, we are looking uh, very heavily now at some cross-platform opportunities. Yeah. So you've heard me say a couple of times, we are a VR first publisher. Yeah. We are, but we are also going to be uh, publishing some non-VR titles, and we are going to experiment with cross-platform play. And we think in that way, you can reach more players and um, have an opportunity to see how they respond cross-platform. Emma? You have to tell the right story the right way on the right platform. So even if you're doing a AAA core game of Halo, there are elements of that narrative that might appeal to a more casual audience. And I think that's what you can do with the AR side of things. Because again, you're not going to have the same density of graphics and the heaviness of it. So you choose one feature of it. and. You know, we were talking about Red Dead Redemption before. Some people play the campaign, and others of us just like to play around, around in the world and yep. search. So you got to tell that it goes into transmedia storytelling and all that jazz. So I do believe, pick out what part of the universe you need to tell the right way in the right platform, and then again, best practice of programming is getting your IP on the right as many channels as you can in the right way. So I do agree with the cross-platform distribution as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, thanks to the panel. Um, so uh, I'm a single solo developer. Um, I have one other guy working with me, so small team. Um, and I have kind of, I kind of have in my head a, uh, a vague outline for an AI-enabled workflow for content generation. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a question mostly for Jenna, but anyone else can weigh in if they have something to say. I'm actually curious about like your workflow since you actually are using it for 3D asset generation. Or are we, are we We're exploring point? it. Uh, We're exploring uh, it. Responsibly so exploring it. Okay. Exploring, excuse me. So you, just 
pontificate about that a bit maybe like talk about potential pain points and like you know where uh, you know where it works and where it doesn't like how you deal with the uncanny valley problem when all the art assets look quite not quite right like how you modify and change to make them actually look like they're cohesive <laughs> I wish I could answer that as, as deftly as you'd like. Um, I can tell you, we acquired a company called Ithwal uh, about a year ago, um, and it's web AR, browser-based. And a lot of the challenges we have with the um, Ithwal engine, and if you go to their website, you can see all the myriad of marketing campaigns and stuff. It's less on the game development side. But just as an example, you know, when you bring assets in from Adobe or all these other places, then they, they're not um, optimized for our format. And so that's why half these companies need to go to you or agencies and spend all this time and money. And we want to figure out how we can be a one-stop shop and make this platform less a distribution channel, but also a creator channel as well. Um, and so for us, we're trying to just solve those pain points in those needs hmm. right now. And one is the optimization of the 3D assets. Hmm. So we're trying to see if you know, AI can come into play there, for example. And again, that's not game development. It's more of the web AR, more marketing assets with enterprise and other, other marketing partners in that sense. Um, looking at it for code reviews, looking at it for um, other ways to just expedite reviews with displaced workforce and things of that nature. So I'm happy to talk offline more specifics, but okay. non-confidentially. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my voice is kind of dead, so I'm trying my best to talk. Um, GDC, good, that means a good GDC. GDC. Yeah. That's good, exactly. early, it's Tuesday. Uh, actually, <laughs> work in Meta, it's wonderful to work, uh, you know, of course, with Skydance. Are wonderful folks to work with. Jen, I'm curious about um, something you said earlier, which is that in VR, a lot of the development should be driven by franchises versus, or like I licensed IP versus necessarily new IP. Curious to hear your thinking there. I just think when you're selling something that's so new, people gravitate to things with brands that they know, mm -hmm. um, but you can't rely on it and you can't rely on the licensor to support it. You still have to make, as Car said, a great game with a great engagement loop, with a great experience so people come back. You have like one chance to release a title, you really don't really get to test it. So I do believe in IP really for VR, because again, you're asking people, there's a lot of friction there from the headset to everything. So I think an IP does help a lot, especially Walking Dead, and you've got a built-in audience. So don't do what Hollywood does, get an IP and then change the entire story and then expect that audience to come. World of Warcraft. Um, oh. <laughs> they do, come on. But then you look at Last of Us, come on. How beautiful yes. is that? Yes. I mean, uh, it was amazing, but um, yeah, I, I think I think bringing in a great franchise like you guys do, and 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 you respect it, and then the audience responds to that, and then it naturally you evangelize it because you've you've come to the table because of that IP. It's hard with an original IP; you just don't have that community. I think it's hard. And and I guess it's it's hard to balance also the fact that a lot of successful consoles, like whether it's like the Xbox, or the initial PlayStation, and so on, built their own IP and used that to actually build out. Franchises. Halo was an original. Call of Duty was an original. Right. I mean, GoldenEye to me was the only good license game back in the day. Right. But I mean, but now, I mean, sure. have your titles through <laughs> platforms. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's not unique to VR or AR, or you know, even that's you know, I think trans transmedia. Um, it's really, it's really tough to make a game that's broadly, um, you know, that's broadly adopted. So I think starting with a license makes a lot of sense. It's just also um, you know, some of those games won the video game lottery, right? Like I think every yeah. uh, every now and then you'll see a game that just mm -hmm. like PUBG through. that's yep. completely yeah. unlicensed that does something totally different. Or Beat Saber on, or on Quest, right? Definitely. Again, they they nailed it. It's, it. Very, they, it's self editing. It's simple. It's a music rhythm game, and there are a ton of music rhythm games in VR, but they nailed it. So yeah, I used to work on Guitar Hero and Rock Band, all those things. But <laughs> yeah. I think it's like it's you know ten times harder to do that than it's it is really to start hard. with the licensed IP for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? I think that's, oh, no. Well, thanks, guys. All right. Thank yeah. you. Right on thank time. you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.